there's an exception to every rule. And I know I've been talking about the first thing you should do in an emergency, and that is to wind your watch. Uh, no knee-jerk reaction. But I'm going to be the first one to admit there are times when that's the worst thing you could do. So stick with us on Flywire to see what I mean. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, I want to look at the miracle on the Hudson. You know, it's that one where Sully lands the Airbus 320 on the Hudson River on a cold day in January 2009. Um, everyone survived, spoiler alert, uh, which is good. And it melds my series of videos about rushing in response to emergency and the ditching series. It kind of hits both of them real well, real well. So I thought I'd put it out here now. At the risk of beating a dead horse, you know, that uh, U.S. Air Flight uh, Cactus 1549, everyone's done a video on this except me, so it's time. Uh, I think there's some important points we can learn from this accident, and I think you might be surprised what I'm going to talk about. So here goes. I want to focus on the crew and their decision making. I want to say right off the bat that I'm not saying any of this to indict the crew. I think they did a great job in an impossibly short time and did exactly what they were supposed to do. They saved the passengers and crew and they used the airplane to do it, okay? I saw the Tom Hanks movie a while ago and you know, it kind of leaves you with the impression that the NTSB was out to hang the crew, the pilots for this, uh, this accident. And I was always kind of mad about that. Everyone survived, who cares about the plane? Well, it turns out, all of that was just drama inserted to make the movie more compelling. Mostly BS drama. And you know, I'm always surprised because this incident really needs some extra punch to make it interesting. You gotta be kidding me. Uh, as a side note, I am in an upcoming video in this ditching series, I'm gonna look at the ditching of a DC-3 in Australia where everyone survived and the authorities did try to hang the crew. So stay tuned. I can't promise you when I'm gonna get it, but it's gonna happen. A few years after this accident, I got to hang out with Jeff, Jeff Skiles, he's the FO, at an air show in Minnesota for a weekend. And you know, I deliberately didn't uh, pester him with questions about this event. He's a good shit, he's a good pilot. As I am sure that Sully Sullenberger is, although I've never met him. So before you think I'm hitting on the crew, just realize that no one is perfect and we can all learn from the mistakes of others, me included, as in, I make mistakes and I can learn from others. Uh, that, that I think it's important. Not enough time to make all the mistakes yourself. So a quick recap here. Cactus 1549 was headed uh, from LaGuardia Airport to Charlotte, North Carolina. And they were running a little late for departure, which is common in the airlines. An airline operation is an incredibly complex thing. So there are so many moving parts where any one of those things can slow things down, okay? One important note is that airlines always schedule block time to allow for common delays on each particular route. And what that means is, is that arriving late is much rarer than departing late. It's magic, you'd be surprised. So anyway, Cactus 1549 took off on runway four with the FO, Jeff Skiles, hand flying the airplane, okay? Skiles had recently gone through the Airbus qualification program and was new to the airplane. Uh, and this is good and bad, okay? On the one hand, all the emergency and checklist work that you do in the simulator was very fresh on his mind. Instead of being a year out of training, he was just right out of training, so his checklist skills were on top of things. On the other hand, his time in the cockpit was limited, and with that f familiarity, uh, with that he lacked the familiarity in the actual airplane. This was his second trip in the airplane. It is what it is. You can never schedule an emergency when it's convenient. It's just, it's Murphy's Law. Anyway, speaking of that, uh, not Murphy's Law, but uh, any, anything we, we do over the, after the event is called Monday morning quarterbacking. Is that bad? Not necessarily. We have the benefit now of extensive research into what happened and a fine look at the timeline. And that's important to actually glean some lessons learned, what they did good, what they did bad, so we can do better in the future. You have to really think about uh, about it yourself, to put, I mean, to put yourself in the moment the Skiles and Sullenberger are in here. It's a difficult spot. So, what happened? Normal takeoff, normal climb out, 
cleaning the airplane up, accelerating, navigating out of busy airspace, somewhere between three and 5,000 feet, Skiles looked up and saw a line of birds. And he said in his interview, he saw a line of perfectly spaced birds. That's a snapshot in time. Probably still remembers it just that way. And later he said he thought they were Canadian geese, which is uh, confirmed during the investigation. There were big birds. He saw the birds go down below the windscreen, and he thought they're going to pass below the airplane. Then he heard boom, 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 followed by compressor stalls as the engines began winding back. And so, unfortunately, they didn't go below the airplane. Time out here for an observation. I had a very similar incident happen to me departing from DFW. It was south flow and the controller had given me a turn to the west. And after rolling out of that turn, passing through about 7,000 feet, I looked out and saw a small black bob, co altitude. I looked inside at the TCAS to see if it was another airplane. It wasn't, so I looked back outside and then it was a dense flock of birds really close to the airplane. My first thought was, be smooth, don't manhandle the airplane. I don't want anything big to break off. Uh, my second thought was, damn it, they're going right for my face. Uh, I didn't even have time to duck. I mean, the reality is it, was, it all happened so fast, and that's what, uh, the way things are at these speeds. Things happen fast, okay? And I think that's kind of a critical point. The lesson to be learned here is that, uh, and, and frankly, it's a lesson that applies to any airplane. There are times that you can and should take your time to assess the situation and take the appropriate action. And there are times when you need to act correctly, and I mean right now. And that's the hard part is to know when those different times are, okay? And the root of the matter is, is what is the correct action? When do you make that choice that I have to do immediate action right now? And for that, I think you need to think about it beforehand. You're rarely gonna make the right call, right call if you have to think it through in the air, you have to have thought about it on the ground. You have to have an approach. And that action that you take isn't always going to be found in a checklist. So I want to look at the exciting bit here in this uh, situation, and that's the bird impact. Uh, these are times after the hour, okay, and they're down to the second. So at 26.52, Skiles called for flaps up after takeoff checklist. At 54, Sullenberger said flaps up. At 07, 2707, Sullenberger said, after takeoff checklist complete. 2710.4, that's just three and a half seconds later, Sullenberger said, birds! Skyle said, whoa! And then immediately thumps and thuds followed by a shuddering sound on the CVR. The engines ingested birds. At 2712, Skyle said, oh shit. Sullenberger said, oh yeah. And at the same time, the engine sounds on the CVR indicate a rollback in RPM. Skyle says, uh-oh, Sullenberger, uh, Sullenberger says, we got one roll, both of them rolling back. 2718, Sullenberger says, ignition start. And what that is, is he reached up and he turned the, starts, the, the switches to start, and that turns on continuous electrical sparks in the engine, so it will, uh, the fuel will ignite and get the engine running, okay? That's how you start them normally, and if you have a compressor stall, it helps keep the engine running, get the fire burning. At 27, 21.3, Sullenberger says, I'm starting the APU. This is not a checklist item at this point, but it gives you electrical power, hydraulics, and air to restart the engines. It is a great backup to have when you have no engines. The APU doesn't give you thrust. 27, 23.2, Sullenberger says, my aircraft followed immediately by Skies replying, your aircraft. So that bird impact sequence took less than five seconds to happen. Way longer for me to say it. Five seconds, and Cactus 1549 was a glider clocking in at more than 100,000 pounds. You know, your whole point of view needs to change in that five seconds. If you have an engine running, you have time. With no engine, uh, your time is limited by the altitude below you. Okay, that's the function here now. And a sense of urgency takes on a whole new meaning. I maintain 10,000. 10,000, Cactus 15.9, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539. Hit first to cross thrust and focus. You're turning back towards LaGuardia. Cactus 15.9, turn left lane 270. Cactus 15.9, turn left lane 270. 
Okay, uh, you need to return to Old Body. Turn left heading up uh, 220. 220. Sorry, stop you to park. He's got emergency returning. It's 1529. He, he uh, bird strike. He lost all engine. He lost the thrust in the engines. He's returning immediately. Cactus 1529. Which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529. We can get it to you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the office. Joey 2760, turn left 070. Oh, 2760. I can't get 15.9. It's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? I get 15.9. Runway 4 is available if you want to make left traffic to runway 4. It is. Okay, I'm sure we any runway. Uh, once over to our right, anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro. Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, LaGuardia Departure Guy, emergency inbound. Hey, guys. Check is 1529 over the George Washington Bridge. Wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to our airport. Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for, uh, runway one? Runway one. That's good. Check is 1529. Turn right 280. Can land runway right. one at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay. Which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be the other. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Alright. Kelly, 2760, contact New York 126.8. 2768, Joey 2760. Cactus, uh, Cactus 15.9, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5, 4718, turn left lane 210. 210, uh, 4718. Oh, I think you said he was going to the Hudson. Cactus 1529, uh, Eastland. Cactus 1529, if you can, uh, you got, uh, runway, uh, 29 available at Newark, it'll be 2 o'clock in some miles. Nine seconds after bird impact, so Sullenberger takes over flying the aircraft and talking to the radio. He was already doing the radio work, but now he's flying the airplane too. And he tells Skiles to get the QRH, that's the Quick Reference Handbook, and it's a book of normal checklists and emergency checklists, and he wanted him to run the loss of thrust on both engines. Skiles began running the, check running the checklist, and Sullenberger declares the emergency. At 2810.6, less than 41 seconds after taking control, Sullenberger has assessed that they don't have enough energy to do anything but crash or land in the Hudson River. And that's a pretty important uh, distinction there. There's no more airports, not an option. We're going, we don't want to hit anything hard either, so really it only gives us the uh, Hudson River. Another side note here, checklists are designed to a certain criterion. Pilots that write them assume that a certain set of going in conditions apply. And what that means is that the loss of thrust on both engines checklist is designed to be done at cruise altitudes, like 35,000 feet, something like that. Plenty of time, plenty of altitude to run the checklist. But on that cold day of January, time and altitude were not on the side of Cactus 1549. The departure controller was very helpful. He was on their side. He cleared the flight to land back at LaGuardia. He coordinated with LaGuardia Tower. And then that didn't work. He coordinated with Teterboro Tower. He's talking to other airplanes that are airborne. And he fought to do what he could do to help 1549, even the past the point where the flight crew no longer responded. I would imagine that is a desolate feeling. It was three minutes and 31 seconds from bird impact to water impact. Skiles raced through the checklist as fast as he could. He tried multiple times to get an engine running even well after the airplane was below 1,000 feet, okay, above the water. The airplane landed on the water fairly fast. It ripped off one engine, damaged the tail section, which hit the water first. 
aircraft uh, floated long enough to get everyone out of, the air, out of the airplane and either in the door rafts or on the wing. And it was fortunate that this airplane was an overwater airplane and it had life rafts at each door. Everyone survived. Amazing is just not good enough word to describe what they did that day. Both the cockpit for getting the airplane down in the water and the cabin crew for getting people out. They were already out by the time the cockpit start, uh, got out of the cockpit to help with what's going on. Question, were mistakes made? Well, yes. The dual engine failure checklist is, as I noted before, designed to air start the engines with plenty of time and 300 knots airspeed. They were never in the envelope to achieve an air start. In fact, Skiles did not have time to get off the first page of that checklist. This isn't necessarily the crew's fault. The ditching checklist was not accomplished. They were pretty well task saturated trying to get this other one done. The APU was started and this gave them electrical and hydraulic power to fly the airplane. They don't know if the rat came out, but there was no sound saying that the rat was out. I must say that the left engine N2, the investigators found that the N2 RPM was high enough to keep the generator online for most of the flight. Between the APU and that uh, is good, but it's also bad because the flight computer stayed on and kept the airplane in nor normal law. And what this did was it restricted the envelope that Sullenberger could fly the airplane in. He flew as slow as he could with the indications he had, but the computer would not allow him to pitch or slow any further. Okay, the net result was that the airplane impacted the water over four times harder than optimal. Investigators concluded that the airplane actually touched down in the Hudson at 132 knots. A different attitude at slower speed probably wouldn't have, uh, would have helped. This led to significant damage to the lower aft fuselage. That damage allowed water to flood the airplane from the aft fuselage going forward, and that restricted exits to the front doors and the overwing exits. The passengers did not take their life vests from under the seats. A couple of people came back to get some uh, while they were out on the wings. And the passengers on the wings were rescued by fast responding boats in the river before they had to get in the water. It was amazing. The response was incredible. It was actually pretty inspiring. People were Johnny on the spot to help. So during this situation, the captain was in charge as he should be. But just how did he use cockpit resource management, CRM, to deal with this emergency? With three and a half minutes, there isn't much time to analyze and discuss, much less to decide on a course of action. In fact, Sullenberger had already decided two minutes into the event that a ditching was what was going to happen. If Skiles could get an engine running, great, but we're going to ditch. That's where we're headed. When you read the interviews and the cockpit voice recorder, that's the CVR transcript, it's obvious that little CRM back and forth was occurring. A little bit happened right before they hit the water. So let me break it down here. Sullenberger flew the airplane, talked on the radios, kept situation awareness of what was happening and when he should prepare for the worst. Okay? He directed Skiles to dig into the checklist to go down that rabbit hole of trying to get an, the engines restarted. If he was lucky and got one relit again, then it would be a close call, like, just like in the movies, and they would have the time and energy to get to an airport, and uh, it'd be fine. Okay. In essence, he directed Skiles to create a Hail Mary to get him out of this mess. What it did, though, is allow him time to be a realist and concentrate on flying the airplane and not hit anything hard. And that is an important point. The investigators noted that there was very little serum that occurred, and they commented on that fact and in as much as that uh, they acknowledged that there was very little time to do any. It all happened so quickly. They just didn't have time. And, but in the investigation, lots of folks did note the extraordinary professionalism and skill of Sullenberger. He was a good captain. He was knowledgeable, you name it. CRM was embedded in everything that US Air did, and that's what US Air's submission to the investigation said. So let me ask you, was there a breakdown in CRM here? Your answer? My answer is no, there wasn't. Sullenberger later said that he had a very, sorry, Sykes Skiles said later that he had a very small role to play in the accident. And again, I would say that's not true either. At the risk of getting into the captain's head here, the crux of my research into this accident is I don't think he consciously made a strategic decision. There just wasn't time to reflect or to consult. From experience, Sullenberger knew 
that trying to get a restart on those engines would suck nearly 100% of available brain power and time. He could not afford that, but it had to be done. So he directed Skiles to do that. If he was su successful, they'd fly the nearest airport and land. If not, he was preparing to land in the water. The thing is, is that Sullenberger, with glider experience as his background, he later said that it made no difference. I just totally disagree. I think that background gave him the finger spits and gefühl, the fingertip feel of what the airplane could do, and he began working the problem. He evaluated the situation, he allocated his resources, and he began executing the best plan he had at the time. Don't hit anything hard. And it was quickly evident that the Hudson was the only viable choice, and also, with his hands full, doing all of this stuff, he made the appropriate announce announcements to the cabin crew and passengers to keep them in the loop and prepare them for the landing. There wasn't a lot of time, okay? And in his interview, I stress that, but in his interview, Sullenberger admitted that other than familiarization with the ditching checklist, not much attention was given to it. The expectation was that if it was necessary, there would be plenty of time to run the che checklist me methodically. And the airlines like you to do things methodically. Need, they don't want knee-jerk reactions because generally that's when people screw up. Methodical is good, except when it's not. My assertion is that it ha has been, in other videos, is that it's much better to think through a situation like this on the ground before you fly. Well, this didn't happen. What did happen was training. CRM was a significant part of training, so much so that the captain and the FO accomplished CRM without consciously thinking about it. Neither recalled active CRM coordination in their interviews, but reading through the CVR reveals that CRM coordination did happen, and it happened at the appropriate times in the checklist. It was ingrained in everything they did. It was, it was an incredible factor. It worked very smoothly, and so much so that they didn't even recognize that they did it, okay. One could make the argument, though, that the captain did not keep the FO in, in the loop with changes in the plan, i.e. in and up in the Hudson. But the FO heard the captain's radio calls and his announcements. He was concentrating on running the checklist to get a relay as fast as possible, and he coordinated the appropriate checklist items with the captain. As I said before, a relay would have saved him the swim. He was doing his job the best he can, and it unfortunately was never gonna work. Okay, so what's my take on what saved all those 155 peoples on board the airplane? My take is training. Okay, Skiles and Sullenberger had never flown before together. Uh, they, but the training program they had undergone standardized procedures to the point that they knew and trusted what the other pilot would do. Their training and experience allowed them to react to a time-critical emergency and save thousands of lives. And and, you know, frankly, a crash landing in New York City in that airplane would have been catastrophic. It would have been a, a huge, it would have been terrible. So, to be honest, you can't anticipate every type of emergency that life can throw at you. But by preparing, training, and thinking through the emergencies that you can anticipate, you will be better prepared to handle those unexpected situations when life throws them at you. My nickel on the grass is that Training is fun, and it just might save your life. That way, you'll be ready to deal with the situation even if you don't have time to wind your watch, okay? Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this right here. Uh, ring the bell for notifications of the next video when it comes out. Um, that way, you, can, you won't miss one. Uh, I wanna thank my Patreon supporters. I'll put it right here. With their help, uh, I put together videos like this one. And if you want to join, I'll leave a link below uh, for, uh, uh, to the Patreon page for Flywire. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire. Click this link for the latest upload. Click this link for whatever YouTube thinks you ought to watch. Or you can click this link to subscribe. Thanks for watching.